Who comes to mind when you think of the word genius? Many of you, I'm sure, immediately thought of one of the following three people. Bill Gates, Rosalind Franklin, or Albert Einstein. Now, we'll come back to Einstein a bit later, but I'm pretty sure that none of you thought of some of the world's most brilliant savants, like Leslie Lemke or Daniel Tomet. In fact, I'd wager that it's safe to say that none of you know who any of these individuals are. But in the next 15 minutes, that's about to change. So what is it for us, then, that truly defines our perception of the term genius? As humans, we tend to, and really we like to think, in patterns. We turn to consistencies, rely on paradigms to explain the things that we can't by merely using logic. But when it comes to the concepts of genius and of intelligence, it's clear that this binary thought process fails us. And that is what is so fascinating about the brain. The deviations in the pattern, the faults in the paradigm, and the rarest of inconsistencies. For it's in these imperfections where the most fascinating of discoveries are made. Today we're going to dive headfirst into these imperfections, and in doing so, develop our conception and our understanding of what it really means to be a genius. It's going to be a fascinating journey, so let's get started. We're all aware of the phrase common in psychology and scientific study. Correlation does not imply causation. Now, although there's little known regarding the specificity of the causal relationship between our brain's physiologies and our intellectual capabilities, a correlation is there. And it's crucial that we don't dismiss it. Here's why. Let's use Einstein as our case example. We all collectively regard Einstein as the father of the term genius. But what's lesser known about him is that his intellectual capabilities may have in part been due to physiological abnormalities in his brain structure. Now, this hypothesis sparked a flurry of studies in the 1950s and early 2000s investigating Einstein's brain. Let's take a look at what they found. We can think of our brains as incredibly complex cities, like Chicago, with hundreds of thousands of side streets and avenues and figures essential to the city's function. Einstein's brain had an abnormally high number of glial cells in his parietal, frontal, and temporal cortices. These are the regions of our brain responsible for mathematical processing, problem solving, and memory formation. Our glial cells are our brain's architects, contributing to the development of its overall structure and our brain's ability to process information. They do so by forming connections between the various nerve cells, or the neurons, of our brains. And these connections are called synapses. We can think of it like this. The more glial cells we have, the more architects we have. And the more architects we have, the more quickly and efficiently our brain can develop these synaptic connections, while simultaneously heightening its ability to learn new skills and retain old memories. Researchers were also able to identify larger astrocytic processes throughout Einstein's brain. Our astrocytes are another type of cell in our brains. They're our bridge builders, our engineers, working in tandem with our glial cells to rapidly develop this multitude of synaptic connections throughout our central nervous system. Now, these astrocytes work in a very unique way. They do so by wrapping around our synapses and bridging them together in a process known as the perisynaptic astrocytic process, or as I like to think of it, our brain's version of a group hug. We can think of the astrocytic processes as the bridges between the various side streets and avenues of our brains. Imagine yourself driving to work. It's a route you take every day. You don't really need a GPS to get there. The more often we drive down a particular street, the less we need any sort of navigational aid. So too, the same can be said for memory. The more intricate our connections to a memory or to a skill, the tougher that memory or skill will be to forget. The more astrocytes we have and the more glial cells we have, the more architects and the more engineers we have, the more information we can process and the more capable we are of higher order cognition and complex problem solving all of which are skills I'd wager someone would need to perform complex quantum mechanical calculations, like those characteristic of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Researchers were also able to identify additional physical connections and structures in areas relevant for motor control and sensory integration, namely our precentral superior and inferior sulci. Sulci and gyri are the little grooves found all over our brains that give it that ribbed, almost maze-like quality. Or to those of you that get queasy looking at internal organs, Think of our earlier metaphor. We can think of the sulci and the gyri as sort of like the macro level side streets and avenues of our brains. 
folding in and around one another in a continuous fluid motion to form them. And as we've seen, what do more connections do for us? They allow for more efficient processing. Now, most neurotypical individuals generally have two to three transverse occipital sulci. This is basically just a fancy way of saying folds in the back of our brain. Now, these folds are found in our visual cortex, and they're important in regulating our visuospatial processing capabilities. Einstein had four. The presence of these additional sulci may have contributed to his heightened visuospatial processing capabilities. And this is especially helpful in tasks requiring visualization and manipulation of abstract concepts in space to central tenets of theoretical physics. Now, obviously, there's plenty more to be said and plenty more to be researched about the relationship between our brain's physiologies and our intellectual capabilities. But two things are for certain. First of all, our brains are pretty magical. And second of all, Einstein definitely wasn't like the rest of us. Let's take another genius this time a musical one. One of the most well-known musical geniuses among fellow pianists is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and for good reason. By the age of four, he could discern whether or not an instrument was out of tune and could learn a piece of music in under 30 minutes. By the age of five, he had composed his first of what would eventually become nearly 600 pieces throughout the course of his musical career. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but ages four and five, I definitely was not composing music. <laughs> Unless you count me belting out hot cross buns as I learned it on the piano. But I've also done quite a bit of research into what exactly it was that made Mozart so special. I'd like to share that research with you all. One of the most fascinating books that I read during high school was titled This, on your, this Is Your Brain on Music. Written by Dr. Daniel Levitin, it investigates into what exactly it is about our brain that gives us such a special connection to music. And as it turns out, the parts of our brains that are activated are akin to those tapped during intense mathematical processing, problem solving, and memory formation. As musicians, we're taught from a young age to pay close attention to the dynamics of a piece, from the softness or strength of the notes to the perfect blend of volume and harmony and pitch and tone. And the combinations are endless, and each variation is what gives a piece its unique character. I want to share a brief but very special story with you all. My aunt is one of the most brilliantly talented pianists and composers I know. From a young age, whenever I get frustrated with the intricacies of a particular piece, in this case, for any musicians in the crowd, it was Debussy's Arabesque Number no. 1, she'd sit me down and paint me a picture. Not a literal one, but a figurative one. Visualize what you're playing, she'd say. What do you see when you hear the subtle changes in dynamics? from the soft and smooth pianissimo to the high and clear soprano to the strong and thunderous forte that you can feel echoing in your very bones between each swirl of arpeggios. A water droplet slowly plinking into a rippling pond of sunshine, sparkling with each and every subsequent falling pattern gently displacing and replacing the lilies that lie on the pond's surface. Now this hyperactivity of our visual and our sensory cortices allows us as musicians to not only read the music, but to visualize the essence of the piece we're playing. Our hippocampus and our frontal lobes working in tandem to keep these beautifully painted mental pictures flowing out of our hands and into the open air around us. To give you all, our audience, the feeling of running their hands through the sparkling, shimmering water <coughs> of each and every trill, scale, and series of harmonized notes we play. And that is the beauty of the brain of a musician. Mozart's brain. And believe it or not, there's actually more to the story. Alongside his musical brilliance, certain behaviors Mozart exhibited have led scientists to theorize that he may have actually been neurodivergent. Biographical recounts of Mozart's behavior suggest that he regularly engaged in obscene language and had numerous physical tics in both his hands and his feet while playing, all of which are characteristic of Tourette's syndrome. Now, I remember reading this and thinking to myself, how can this be? How can one of the world's most brilliant musical geniuses simultaneously suffer from a neurological condition? There's actually a term for this phenomena. Savant syndrome, derived from the French word savoir, or knowing person, is an extremely rare condition in which an individual with a superhuman intelligence concentrated in a particular area 
simultaneously experiences some sort of neurological deficit. Now this intelligence is typically concentrated in one of the following five areas. You can have the arts, mechanical or visuospatial skills, calendar calculating, which is the ability to perform complex mental calculations regarding dates, days of the week, or calendars in your head without any sort of external aid or reference, music, or mathematics. Curiously enough, this condition is always paired with an extraordinary memory. And even cooler is that this memory is innate. It's not taught, can't be learned. These savants are born with it. Yet for some reason, they don't receive nearly the same level of recognition or acknowledgement as geniuses like Einstein and Mozart. But if we look a little bit closer, we can see how the cases that we don't typically consider can actually lead us to developing a better understanding of what it really means to be a genius, one that is more nuanced, diverse, and inclusive. Take Leslie Lemke. Born prematurely, Lemke was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, blindness, and brain damage. Yet his musical prowess rivaled that of Mozart himself. Despite having no prior visual capacity and no prior musical experience, Lemke was able to play songs of incredibly high caliber, like Tchaikovsky's Concerto No. 1, flawlessly, after merely hearing a playback of the song once. An astounding feat from both a neuroscientific and a musical perspective. Think back to Einstein. The benefits of his multitude of synaptic connections extend far beyond the realm of theoretical physics. Music activates so many different areas of our brains. Our auditory cortices for listening to the music, our hippocampus and our frontal lobes for following along with the music we know, predicting the harmonies and the melodies that come next, our motor cortex for playing the music, our visual cortex for reading the music, and musicians train these circuits every single day to the point of perfection, and in cases like Lemke's, beyond. Take Daniel Tomet. Diagnosed with autism at a young age, Tomet became famous for reciting 22,514 digits of pi for memory a feat which took roughly five hours. Fluent in 11, like, that was my reaction when I was learning this too. <laughs> I was like, wow. Fluent in nearly nine languages, it took Tomet a mere seven days to learn, speak, and become fluent in Icelandic, a notoriously difficult language to know. Now, the uniqueness of his brain actually extends further. Tomet has an incredibly rare ability known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is a fascinating condition in which one sensory experience in an individual can inadvertently trigger another. We can think of the synesthetic experience as the sort of cross-wiring of all of the sensory circuits in our brains. For example, someone with synesthesia might see colors when they hear music, taste flavors when they read certain words, or even begin to associate specific colors with specific numbers or letters. Regardless of the type of the synesthete, this condition is consistent and involuntary meaning individuals with synesthesia experience these associations without consciously choosing to. Now, Tomet's particular phenotype of synesthesia allows him to physically see numbers and calculations in his mind. He once claimed that each number, ranging from 1 to 10,000, had its own unique color and shape and feel and texture, claiming that 289 was particularly ugly and physically repulsed him to look at, while 333 was breathtakingly beautiful. And curiously enough, researchers are actually finding correlations between hyperactive brain areas and synesthetes and those involved in mathematical processing, in Einstein's heightened capabilities. It's not a talent just isolated to musicians. And even cooler is that it's an exact replica of the visualization technique my aunt taught me. We are literally seeing sound in real time. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's pretty cool. Evidently, we can see that Lemke and Tomet experience the world in incredibly unique ways, despite their simultaneous psychological impairments. And it's becoming more clear to us and more clear to me, the more that we learn about these amazing individuals, that they have more in common with some of the world's most brilliant geniuses than we were ever really aware of. Albert Einstein's IQ was 160. Mozart's was estimated to be between 150 and 155. I want you all to just take a quick second to think, percolate your mind, as to what you think the respective IQs of Lemke and Tomet are. Most of you, I'm sure, probably rated them pretty highly, given their respective geniuses in both music and mathematics. But you'd be mistaken. A gifted musician's IQ, 58. A genius with numbers, 150. 
Why such a staggering discrepancy if they're both savants? And as we've seen, both clearly geniuses in their respective fields of music and mathematics. It actually has nothing to do with either of their innate intelligences and everything to do with their abnormal brains. So what's the take home message? What does this boil down to? Genius is a big picture concept. It's pretty difficult to quantify. If you were given nothing more than the names Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and Leslie Lemke side by side on a sheet of paper with their respective IQs, of course your immediate reaction would be to label Mozart as the smarter or the more intellectually adept of the two individuals. But as we've seen here today, that couldn't be further from the truth. So many factors play a role in determining someone's intellectual capabilities, their psychologies and physiologies being just a few. Intelligence isn't really something that we're capable of narrowly defining, as much as the modern educational system may try to do. When we really take a step back to think about how intricately distinctive each and every single one of our physiologies and psychologies are, each variation of our ventricles, the grooves in our gyri, and the changing chemical concentration in combination with our subconscious that make us who we are, we learn that we are as many and as beautiful as all of the stars in the night sky. We learn, I learned, to know that there is beauty and potential in the abnormal brain and in the abnormal. As a kid, and even now, I refuse to give up on the belief that magic exists. And while I've yet to find it in the form of witches, wizards, or fire-breathing dragons, though I will never not hold out hope, through my research, I found an entirely different, yet equally fascinating kind. One that's been right in front of my face, or dare I say it without sounding crazy, all in my head this entire time. Our brains! After today, I hope you can walk out of here with a renewed sense of appreciation for yourself. And instead of questioning your intellectual quirks, embrace them and everything your big, beautiful, brilliant brain has to offer in one gigantic astrocyte group hug. Remind yourself, there's so many ways to be a genius. There's so many ways to be intelligent. But most importantly, there's so many ways to be wonderfully and beautifully human. Thank you.